so much in terms of this Kurt Cobain investigation, and um, you know we're you know we're so pleased to have you again. Um, you know, and uh, so much of your information that I used for the reports that uh, that I compiled was from your website, CobainCase.com. And um, you know, I just wanted to go over some of the some of the latest things that are kind of concerning you. Um, and uh, so I just combed over, you know, you know, the alarming forensic details surrounding the Cobain case, so that you didn't have to really go through that that lengthy portion. Um, but can you tell us some of the latest updates involving the SPD concerning the case, in particular, cold case detective Mike Szynski, in addition to the undeveloped crime scene photos? Well, yeah, uh, Detective Szynski acted as the official spokesperson for the Seattle Police Department uh, in late 2014. Uh, they did a televised interview with him on Cairo Television in Seattle uh, that interview is online on YouTube, and I also have a response to Detective Szynski's interview online that I think people would be interested in watching and uh, listening to how I respond to some of the things that he says. But for one thing, he, you know, he acts as if he was actually there and he saw what happened, and he claimed that Kurt sat down and loaded the shotgun right before killing himself, he says. Um, of course, we know the shotgun was loaded with three shells, so that's a pretty incredible statement for a detective to make, uh, talking, you know, positively that this was a suicide, and yet he loads the shotgun with three shells. And obviously my question would be, what was he planning on doing with the other two shells, going duck hunting? You know, it, it just <laughs> doesn't make any sense. Uh, he hey. referred to the heroin overdose, in his words, as the largest amount of heroin in an overdose in the history of their county. Mm. This is what he learned from the uh, Seattle uh, Medical Examiner's Office. So when people in the past, especially in the media, uh, have repeated things that the police have said and referred to this case as a, a textbook suicide and, a, you know, just like an everyday occurrence, uh, this is one of the rarest so-called suicides that they've ever had in the history of their county, and and it's on record now coming from a Seattle PD spokesperson. <laughs> he said he also said after injecting the heroin, he says Kurt put the caps back on the syringes and put them in the cigar box found on the floor. Right. Uh, you know he he admitted that. Well, he said in his words, if the shotgun blast didn't kill kill him, the heroin would have. At one point, he even referred to this as, in his words again, um, this is slightly inaccurate, but this is what he said, that he had injected himself with, uh, he rolls his eyes and says, something like 11 times um, a lethal overdose of heroin. So he says if the shotgun blast didn't kill him, the heroin would have. Now, this again is an admission that this was a fatal overdose of heroin. And he neglects to address the fact that, uh, you know, that heroin, once injected into the vein, gets to the brain within seconds. And yet somehow Kirk had the ability to roll down his sleeves, put the stuff away in, the, in his uh, cigar box on the floor, his heroin kit, and put the caps back on the syringes and all this, and then pick up this shotgun and shoot himself. So... Uh, he basically buried the, the the detectives that did the original work on this case and right. spoke to people that have come before him to try <laughs> to cover up the sloppy work that they did. Right. Now, yes. later on, after that, I, I believe somebody, one of his superiors, said, oh, man, you did a terrible job there. we got to clean this up a little bit. So mm -hmm. they had him write a, a police report. Well, in his police report, which is now on record and available for the public to see, he says that the blood level from the autopsy, uh, the morphine blood level, was 1.52 milligrams per, li per liter. Now, this is the first time since Kurt Cobain's death that there's been an official confirmation by the Seattle Police Department or the medical examiner's office that that was the right proper figure. I've stated that it was. I've challenged anybody to prove me wrong over all these years, but I've consistently had 
people contact me and say, how do you know? You'd have to have the coroner's report. Do you have the coroner's report? And I just said, I, I guarantee that was the amount. And they they can say whether that was right or wrong. You know, if I was off by even a one hundredth of a milligram per liter, they could say, no, he's wrong. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But I guarantee yeah. that was the right amount. And now we have it confirmed in a written police report that was the right amount. So that kind of puts the end to that debate. Right. So, so that you're telling me that the so the um, the 1.52 milligrams that was found post mortem in his bloodstream, right? That's that's what you're referring right. to. Yeah. yeah. And that would and, indicate and that would indicate a much I'm higher sorry. dose. Oh, that's right. That would indicate a much higher dose, right? Upon injection. Yeah, somewhere between 200 and 225 milligrams per. Um, I'm sorry, of an, of, for the injection, for the actual injection. Right, uh, right. Yeah, a lot of people get confused by this, and they read the 1.52 milligrams, and they think that's all he injected. Well, that's not very much uh, to inject. Right. But when you, uh, in an autopsy, they, they talk about how much is in the blood per liter, and then they can calculate from that uh, 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 an approximate amount of, heroin that had to have been injected to reach that level uh, mm -hmm. post-mortem. Mm -hmm. That's great. Wow. I didn't realize that report uh, had actually um, been officially uh, uh, released by Szynski there. So I'll have to go and take yeah. a look at that. Very interesting. Yeah, I was so happy to see that because now it takes it off of my shoulders now. Uh, I, you know, they don't need me to tell them that anymore, and, and I don't need to argue about it. It's in the police, in the police report from the Seattle Police Department. Wow. Wow. So, so knowing that and knowing kind of, uh, you know, so many field experts have come forward in, in support of much of your initial forensic findings, uh, in the Cobain case, um, do you, do you now feel pretty vindicated, uh, in terms of that? Uh, after all these years of, of digging into this? Oh, yeah. I, uh, you know, when you have people like Dr. Cheryl Weck and, and especially Norm Stamper, who was the police chief at the time of Kurt Cobain's death, and he's in the, the new film coming out, Soaked in Bleach. Both of them are in it. Mm. And Norm Stamper especially just blows me away with his, his candid comments and his remarks. And Basically, to sum up everything that he says uh, at the end, and you can see this in the trailer, trailer for the film that's online, he says, if I were the chief today, I would reopen this case. Wow. Well, you know, I, I'm not needed anymore. When the former police chief says that based on what he's learned about the case now, okay, you know, <laughs> my job is done. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm going to have to be available for, uh, you know, whatever as the film comes out and everything. But I, when you talk about vindication, yes, uh, it's no longer just me. It never was really just me. It was also Courtney Love's own attorney right from the beginning. The two of us worked on this case behind the scenes, and she encouraged me. She was highly suspicious. Right. But now we've got these... these uh, Dr. Wecht, who's a world-renowned expert, he's uh, supervised over 38,000 autopsies in his career. Um, and he makes statements in the film that uh, that it's just, you know, nearly, he can't imagine how someone could inject that much heroin in their system and then shoot themselves. And he says in the film, it just doesn't make any sense. Right. You know, so... Uh, if anybody has seen it all, it's certainly Dr. Wecht. And when he makes right. a statement like that, it, I just, uh, uh, again, I feel, in your words, vindicated. I don't really think of it in those terms, but I guess that's really the proper term to express how it makes me feel. Sure. And and you're referring to Cyril Wecht, who is the president of the American Academy of Fre Forensic Science, correct? Right. Yeah. yeah. And, he, you know, he's used, he's been used as an expert on every television, major television network for years uh, during, well, uh, President Kennedy's assassination, mm -hmm. uh, O.J. Simpson, Dr. Phil show uses him all the time. And whenever Dr. Phil introduces him on the show, he refers to him as, he says, I consider 
Dr. West to be the number one pathologist in the world, you know. So he, he's just got such a reputation for for being the best there is, and that's why all the television networks use him on all, most of the cases that they uh, cover on television. Shows like 20, 20, 48 hours, um, just the news in general sometimes will pop up there. So there's really no better person to go to uh, when it comes to something like this. And he was just totally outraged at the way the Seattle police handled this case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the clip he says uh, in the uh, the upcoming docudrama by Benjamin Slater, Soaked in Bleach, uh, he, he says um, uh, he's professionally disturbed in, a w- in the way in which Kurt, the Kurt Cobain case was mishandled. I thought that was a, an excellent quote uh, for the trailer there. Uh, really right. very, very impactful and really kind of gives you a fuller scope of what actually took place there. <clears throat> and uh, in addition to that... Um, I also made a note of the Rosemary Carroll quote. What can you tell us about the Rosemary Carroll quote that's used in that Soaked and Bleach trailer? Because that's also very revealing. Uh, I don't recall which which quote was in the trailer. Can you refresh my memory? Just sure. a few yeah. words, and I don't remember. Yeah, the yeah. It was uh, it was the so-called suicide note that she uh, that she uh, had suspicions of. I believe you guys just oh, had a short blurb yeah, on. She- during one of our telephone calls that was tape recorded, um, and it's in the film, she's telling me that she believes that the suicide note was copied or traced. In other words, she was telling me she didn't believe that Kurt really even wrote that entire note. Um, she, I think her phraseology was something like she believed it was cobbled together from piece, bits and pieces of things that he had written before. Now, she doesn't say... So, you know, it was obviously he was murdered, or I believe he was murdered, or whatever. But by simply saying that she didn't believe that that note was written by Kurt Cobain, that means it wasn't placed there by Kurt Cobain either. And right. that means that she had to believe in her mind that he was murdered. There's right. no other way to explain somebody else writing that note and putting that there, but yet Kurt Cobain killed himself. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, here's Courtney's own attorney basically telling me she really believes it was a, a murder. Right. Now, I I, I disagree uh, w- with her opinion about the note. I've always said, well, not always, but uh, when I when I did finally come out and start speaking publicly, uh, I did say that I do believe Kurt Cobain wrote the body of that note, but it wasn't a suicide note. It was a retirement note telling people he wanted to quit performing. He wanted to leave the music business. Um, and and then at the very bottom of the note where the handwriting gets all messed up in, in very large letters, um, and I've blown that up on a copy machine so that I can look at the, the lines a little bit better. And you can see where it starts, where it says, which will be so much happier without me. From that point on, when, when you magnify this, you can actually see that the, the lines are thinner than the rest of the lines in the entire note. Mm-hmm. So something happened there. Something happened when he, when he wrote the one part, or when the one part of the note was written, I should say, because I don't necessarily believe he wrote it, mm-hmm. but something changes drastically there. The, the lines become thinner all of a sudden, and yet that's the only part of this note that even sounds remotely close to becoming a suicide note. Wow, yeah. So, you know, I've often wondered why Cobain's body was cremated so quickly after the investigation. Um, I imagine you have as well. Um, Why do you think that... No, I've never wondered why. (laughs) Well, I mean... I've never wondered why. I've known why. I think it's pretty uh, obvious. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess it's obvious to to those who are uh, close to the case, but... um, Whose decision was it, I guess I should rephrase the question, whose decision was it who to cremate his body? And I, was it a family decision? Was it wit- written in his will? Uh, was it something that... Uh, was no. It? Okay. Uh, it, it would have been Courtney Love's decision, and okay. uh, she would be the only person that would have been able to make that decision. 
Uh, even right. if his mother didn't want to do it, Courtney Love could still demand that it was done. Now, we've heard from other people, and I, you know, I haven't tracked this down because it doesn't really matter to me personally, but we have heard from other people that Kurt never wanted to be cremated when he died and mm-hmm. or that he wouldn't have wanted that. I don't know. That's speculation and sure. neither here nor there. But so many other things happened. I mean, the police returned the shotgun to Courtney. She gave it to mothers against uh, violence or whatever to have it destroyed and melted down. Um, And, you know, so that was destroyed. The greenhouse was torn down uh, not too long after Kurt Cobain died. It wasn't immediately torn down, but I think within months. I don't recall the exact time period. Mm -hmm. But when I heard that they... They even tore down the greenhouse. I mean, it really became obvious she was getting rid of any possible trace of, of remaining evidence that there that anybody could ever possibly come up with. Right now, so you know, it's funny because you mentioned that the house being or the greenhouse being torn down and uh, the shotgun being melted down. It actually reminds me of a case that I actually worked on. Uh, in terms of a, a, an investigative research standpoint, uh, with the death of Brittany Murphy in Hollywood. And there was a lot of suspicion around her death also. And the house, her house was actually torn down shortly after her death before, uh, everything has, was revealed. And I guess the toxicology results revealed, uh, according to an independent toxicology company that in fact she was poisoned with 10 different metals of poison. So I, I think it's kind of interesting to note that there's a correlation with other cases. And that brings me to another question with you is, uh, you know, I recently discovered uh, two other cases I thought you might find interesting from a forensic standpoint. One involved a forced heroin injection and another one involved a recently overturned murder-suicide back in 2012. You know, during the course of the last 20 years, were you able to find other cases that supported some of the detailed evidence found in the Cobain case? Well, any all anybody really has to do is watch television shows like 2020 and 48 hours sure. uh, 48 hour mystery uh, and you realize you know if you do take the time to watch shows like that if you're interested in that type of thing they have these this type of thing all the time on television right and i know as a former police officer and a former detective and private investigator um stage suicides happen all the time mm-hmm. um I haven't, I don't know the exact statistics, um, nationwide, but I would say probably close to almost one a day across the country. Wow. Um, I've certainly, I actually as a private investigator just months before Kurt Cobain's death, I was working on a, on a, on a death of an attorney that was highly suspicious. Wow. And I won't go into all the details, but I firmly believe that was a state suicide. And I'm I'm not one of these people that you know I that get into uh, you know that are suspicious of of stuff all the time and just autumn. In fact, when this client hired me, I had a sit down talk with her. It was the sister of the attorney who allegedly killed himself. When she hired me, I told her, "Okay, now this is going to cost you a lot of money for me to get into this and to do all the things that it's going to take." to resolve this and come up with a a final conclusion. And I just need to warn you that the chances are I'm going to get back to you and tell you that, yes, I believe it was a suicide. I'm sorry to tell you. Because the odds are, you know, in most suicides, the the family just don't want to believe it was really a suicide, especially if there was not a note. And and so, you know, they, they don't want to believe that's what happened. They feel guilty about it and all that. So they want to prove that this person didn't commit suicide. Well, in this particular case, I started off thinking that I was going to be getting back to my client and telling her it was a suicide. And wow, this, this was, this was so obviously a staged murder to look like a suicide, uh, I could write another book about it. And if this would have been a famous person, of course, it would have gone the same route as the Kurt Cobain death. Unfortunately, when you're not famous, you don't get the media attention, and uh, there's not a whole lot you can do about it, you know. But uh, anyhow, yeah, it does happen all the time. You can talk to any homicide investigator, uh, read any book about homicide investigations, and 
And that's why it's so important to always have a homicide investigator at the scene of any dead body. Right. When I was a cop, when we arrived at the scene of a dead body, our job was simply to preserve the scene, keep people away until the homicide detectives got there. Even if it was obviously a suicide to us, we didn't. Re- that wasn't our job to determine. It was the job of the homicide investigators. And in Seattle, I was told uh, that normally, you know, uh, two of the detectives, Sergeant Cameron and Sergeant and Detective Kirkman, both told me on separate occasions. Normally, we don't even send the homicide team to the scene of a suicide. Our patrol officers handle that. And that's just ludicrous. You you mm-hmm. don't allow a patrol officer to determine how a person died. They're not trained to do that. Right. So, you know, it, it, the, the whole investigation was botched from the beginning. And it, nobody needs to take my word for that at all. I mean, I've been here to point these things out. But it's all in the police reports that have been released through the Freedom of Information Act to the public. Uh, can be obtained by anyone, and if you read those police reports and you see what they've said, and you see that they declared it a suicide the very same day that the body was found, they write in the report, we're on the scene of a suicide, et cetera, et cetera. And then you listen to some of the documented um, statements made by spokespeople for the Seattle Police Department, like on when we did the Unsolved Mysteries episode, the Seattle police spokesman at that time said, well, our homicide investigators actually approached this scene as a possible homicide. It was investigated thoroughly as a possible homicide. <laughs> well, that doesn't, that just doesn't match up with the written police reports. Right. So there's stuff like that. And then Suzinski just really dug a deep hole for the department on this case when he did his televised interview. So, Again, this isn't my opinion. This is something that anybody that is literate and can read and comprehend, uh, they can read that, they can go to YouTube and see these interviews online and the statements from the Seattle Police Department and compare the two. And everybody, I don't care whether you believe Cobain was murdered or not or Courtney had anything to do with it or not, that's irrelevant to me. The point that I've always tried to make is this case was not handled properly, and it has to be done over again. Right. And at the very least, the findings on, on Kurt Cobain's death need to be changed from suicide to undetermined. If we can just get that, my, I have a very low bar here. If we can just get the findings changed from suicide to undetermined, I would consider my work on this case to be a total success. Do you think that will occur after the, <clears throat> excuse me, do you think that might occur after the docudrama Soaked in Bleach uh, appears? Well, I, I always, of course, I always have to take a positive <clears throat> attitude towards this, uh, just like an athlete playing in the World Series or whatever. You know, of course I believe that it's going to happen. Um, I, I don't see how it can't happen. It's just a matter of uh, publicity, really. It, it sounds, you know, it kind of sounds like uh, I've been criticized as someone who just wants to get attention and wants to get my 15 minutes of fame and all that. Well, first of all, I'm 68 years old. Uh, I could care less. I have no talents. I can't act. I can't sing. I'm not a good-looking guy. I don't uh, I don't care about fame or you know getting my face on TV or in a film or anything. In fact, I don't like watching myself. I, I, it just looks terrible to me. But uh, we do need media. We do need, need the major mainstream media to jump in on this. And I I'm hoping and I believe that the release of Soap and Bleach will cause this to happen. It's being released worldwide. It's been right. sold to Germany, Japan, several other countries already. They're, they're planning release dates already there. Um, ben Statler is working on things here that I can't talk about. Mm-hmm. But um, when when it is released and the public is able to see this, I believe it's going to 
it's going to cause an earthquake in the rock industry. Um, there's going to be a lot of buzz about this. People are going to finally hear the truth. And I'm telling you, uh, yeah, I am in the film, but I'm totally irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. Just listen to the experts. You know, listen to Dr. Weck. Listen to Norm Stamper. Listen to, um, oh, I can't think of his name right now, but the, there's a, a homicide investigator in there uh, that's had a, a like a 40-year career, and he's written a book about homicide investigations, and it's kind of a Bible for homicide investigators, and he makes a lot of comments in the film, too, uh, talking about how this was handled improperly and and it should have been done a different way so uh, the bottom line is you know I, I i don't care what anybody thinks about me or what my motives are in this or whatever uh it doesn't matter anymore listen to ec- the experts listen to the people that really uh you know are are uh respected around the world for their trade, for their for their professional uh, skills and their experience, and right. just take me out of the picture. It doesn't matter anymore what I say. You know, they've confirmed everything I've been saying for twenty over twenty years. Right, right. And uh, you know, on that note, um, or sort of on a different note, but uh, related. You know, I, I don't know. I believe you may have seen. I'm not sure because I think I saw a post of yours recently. Uh, commenting briefly about uh, Francis Bean Cobain's comments in the media this past week. Um, uh, what can you tell us? Uh, what do you? What was the gist of that message uh, on your post when you were talking? About well, I, I just I've always you know I saw Francis Bean a couple of times back in 1994. I when I first went to the Peninsula Hotel, she was running around the aisles calling for her her um, nanny, who, <laughs> who her nanny's name apparently was Francis. Also, and but she called her Franny, and I just remember <laughs> Frances Dean running around going Franny, Franny, <laughs> Franny, <laughs> and she was so cute. You know, I've I've got several children. I've got um, six grandchildren and three great grandchildren, and I love children, and so I'll always have that picture in my mind of little Frances Dean running around uh, as a baby, and then when I went up to Seattle after Kurt's body was found. Uh, and I went to Courtney's house. Uh, there was a period of time after talking to Courtney where we were waiting for Dylan to arrive, and I went into the kitchen. Um, Courtney went upstairs. I went into the kitchen and sat down, and Francis was sitting in the high chair eating and just a couple of feet away from me, and she just kept staring at me, you know, with those big bright eyes and everything. And, and I, those pictures are just burnt in my in my mind, uh, same as, you know, with my own children. I remember them as babies as if it were yesterday. Um, so she's always had a warm spot in my heart, and I feel so sorry for her. Yeah. And my response to her comments and her involvement in this film and whatever she says, I've, I've always said she was a victim. I believe we need to leave her alone. When yeah. people on Twitter start talking about Francis, why don't you talk to Francis? Why don't you go up there and meet with her? Why don't you call her or whatever? You know? yeah. No. If she wants to call me, I'd love to talk to her if she wants to talk to me, but mm-hmm. I'm not going to harass her or hound her. And yeah. I actually want her, it's more healthy for her to love her mother. Right. You know? I need to do the job that I'm supposed to do, and the police need to do their job. And if Courtney ends up getting arrested, that's fine. I mean, prisons and jails are full of people who have children at home. And it's sad, but that's life. And it, we don't not put people in jail or prison because they have children, or we have criminals running wild. We have total chaos in this country. So, but I, I feel for Francis, and so my my post was really very simple. I said, Francis is a victim in this. Um, what I, I don't have it right in front of me, but it was something like, uh, who knows what she actually uh, knows, um, and I put that in big, bold letters, as opposed to what she's been told all these right. years. Right. So, you know, we don't know that. We can't read her mind. Um 
I have mixed feelings about if she were to come forward and say, I think my mom had my dad killed, I have mixed feelings about that. I mean, it's fine for me to believe that, and it's fine for the police to believe that, but it hurts me, you know, to have a, a child, um, you know, have bad feelings or a bad relationship with either parent. Right. So, you know, I, it, whatever Frances does is up to her. Whatever she says is up to her. I do believe she's been totally brainwashed and totally misled by everybody around her, including the, and especially her mother, Courtney Love. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like she's assumed some of the same attitudes about Kurt as Courtney has. Um, but you know, I just, I'm, I prefer not to involve Francis in, in sure. this at all. You know, Courtney, sure. of course, is trying to drag her into everything. Right. That's it, what it seems you like. Know, yeah. Uh, whenever you see them hugging, I don't think I've ever seen a picture of Francis hugging her mother. It's always Courtney hugging Francis, and Francis is just standing there with kind of a blank look on her face. So, uh, right. you know, anybody can interpret that however they want. But uh, I, I think, well, if, uh, again, I think I just yeah. it's something I'd rather not uh, get too involved in, and I, sure. I just care too much about Francis as a person. Yeah. And, and, you know, last time we spoke about this case, you mentioned a very detailed uh, or a detailed uh, uh, suicide pact that you remembered shortly after Kurt's death. And uh, it was a very interesting story. And, um, and you know, and I, I, I have to think that, you know, again, I want to reiterate, that's really, is it right that that's always been sort of the prime, one of the primary factors for you to see justice in this case for those who had copycat cases that were related to Kurt's death? Well, um, I, I couldn't follow that whole line of thought there, but sure. um, in, in reference to the uh, uh, suicide pact, you know, there was a, a story, in, I believe in Rolling Stone, um, before Kurt even died, I think, Courtney gave an interview to someone where she talked about Kurt um, uh, was in the hospital when she was in the hospital um, giving birth to Francis or whatever, but Kurt was in there for some reason, too, and she went into his room, and he had a gun, and she claims she grabbed the gun from him. He was going to kill himself, and she claims she grabbed the gun from him and said, no, here, me first, I'll do it first, you know. And, uh, it was just a, a stupid story. It didn't make any sense. But, but you know, it seems like anything Courtney Love tells the press, they print it almost as if it's fact, you know. Um so that was the first incident that I know of where uh, there was supposedly, you know, this mutual uh, di- discussion or talk about both of them committing suicide. And then the fact that when Courtney hired me, she told me that she planted a story in the press the night before uh, that she had overdosed. Um, I believe, looking back on all this, that, when she found out that Kurt left rehab on Friday and um, we later on Monday, we found out the day after Courtney hired me, we found out that um, Kurt had been at the house on Saturday morning. So by Saturday night, before the night before I got hired, I believe she planted that story in the press because she thought Kurt was going to be killed that night. And mm-hmm. she wanted to look, she was going to, if that happened, she, her story was going to be that she tried to overdose too. They had a suicide pact. Um, then when a few days later, when I was up in Seattle and we were searching for Kurt, um, on the night when she sent us back to the house and she told us allegedly where to look for the shotgun, um, again, uh, now this is the time when Rosemary Carroll told me she heard Courtney on the phone tell Dylan to be sure to look in the greenhouse. Um, So she believed, based on that conversation, that we were going to be checking the greenhouse because she told Dylan to do that. Mm -hmm. And this is in the film, too. These recordings are in the film where where Rosemary, uh, I tell Rosemary that um, Dylan said that she never said that. 
And Rosemary said, well, it's obvious that they're lying because Rosemary knew that she heard what she heard, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, So the, the point is, Sure enough, that night when Courtney honestly believed we were going to finally find Kurt dead in the greenhouse, because by then I'm sure she knew he it had been done and that he was dead, um, she ends up again in the hospital, and the first headlines out there was that she overdosed. And then when it turned out that his body wasn't found and by until the next morning, the story got changed to where she had written a prescription for herself from a pad from the doctor that left this prescription pad supposedly in her hotel room, and there were just some ashes or something in, in an ashtray that the police thought were drugs, and they arrested her for that. And the whole thing just totally changed, you know, because it, it no longer could look like a suicide pact. It was too late. His body was found the next morning, and she had gone into the hospital the night before. So then when... You know, the week after that, when I was with Courtney and we were driving in the car and headed up to Carnation, we heard Paul Harvey on the radio uh, doing a story, a short little, his little bits, you know, in between in the commercial time on radio shows. Mm-hmm. He would have a little two or three minute bit that he would do. And uh, he was talking about Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love, and he mentioned something about them having a suicide, uh, a rumor that they had a suicide pact. And mm. again, I think that was something that Courtney had planted in the press and, and, you know, started a little bit of buzz about, you know, they were going to kill themselves together or whatever. And it was just a romanticized version to give Courtney some publicity, uh, some added publicity for regarding Kurt's death. But looking back on all those separate incidences, it certainly appeared to me that that's what she was trying to set up. Mm -hmm. Now, I need to remind you, at this time, I still thought Kurt committed suicide. Mm -hmm. I I was just totally confused, and red flags were popping up all over the place. I mean, I, you know, when every magazine article that comes out that has Kurt Cobain's face on the cover and it says suicide and everything you see on television and MTV and and all that and it talks about suicide, 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 it's easy for anybody to get brainwashed. And and I was just as brainwashed as everybody else. It was hard for me to fight that off and, and just say, but if that's true, then why did this happen? And why did that happen? And if Courtney is saying this and if she's doing that, then why this and why that? You know, just red flags that any investigator would pick up on. And it it took seven months for me to finally, I was gradually starting to lean in that direction, but it took seven months for me to finally come to the conclusion that Kurt Cobain was murdered and that, it, that Courtney Love and Michael DeWitt were involved in planning the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So, um what what did you think when Dylan Carlson reversed his, uh, or he was either misquoted or he intentionally, uh, uh, you know, said he didn't know about the greenhouse after he had already talked to you about that? What did you think when you first heard that story in the magazine that it appeared in? Well, that was something else I discussed with um, with Rosemary Carroll, and and she agreed that uh, that was that was a lie that was it was obvious and of course they know it was i mean i had discussions with them uh not only before but or you know when when we heard it on the radio and they mentioned the greenhouse he described it to me he told me what it looked like and where it was he said it was a room above the garage uh so i think he was just being defensive when he got interviewed by the newspaper and and he just blurted it out he didn't even know the greenhouse was there there's no way that somebody you know especially kurt's best friend that was coming to the house all the time to see him there's no way they wouldn't know that was there now right. the only times i was there were at night in in the very dark uh night with no lighting except for a bright spotlight on the garage that was shining on our face and glaring off our windshield and heavy rain which amplified the glaring of that spotlight 
But my attention was directed off to the right, uh, to the house, because all the lights were on in the house and all the, there were no shades drawn or curtains or anything. You could see right through in there. And I was more concerned about what was going on inside the house, somebody walking around with a shotgun or whatever. Um, and then when we came out of the house from the back, the greenhouse, you couldn't see the greenhouse because there was lattice work with um, flowers and um, vines and things up there that were covering that up, so you didn't notice it. Right. Uh, and as I was backing out, getting in the car to back out, of course, I was turned around looking behind me and didn't see what was in front there. So it was it was Dylan's job to show me the greenhouse, I've always been somewhat sort of embarrassed or whatever, although I know what happened and what was going on in my mind. But I, you know, I, I was critical of myself. Why, why didn't I look there? Why didn't I see it? But right. the fact is there were at least five other people that were on that property looking for Kurt Cobain in the broad daylight with, you know, the greenhouse plainly visible after Kurt was already dead. And that includes, on two occasions, Seattle police officers that went to the house to look for Kurt, and they spoke to workers on the property. So there's, uh, it said workers, plural. So there's at least two other people on the property that were notified that Kurt was missing. Um, and then we know that Callie and his girlfriend, Jennifer, were at the house going back and forth also during the time and after the time that Kurt was dead. And, and they were there during daylight hours. So, you know, anybody that says, gee, you know, it's your job to find him, well, yeah, I agree with that. And if I was the only person that had ever gone up there, I'd feel even more bad about it probably. But the fact that the police went up there and that Callie was staying there on and off and coming back and forth during the daytime, and he was told, allegedly, you know, to look in the greenhouse, too. Uh, you know, it, it just kind of spreads things out a little bit as far as the responsibility for not finding Kurt until the electrician found him on Friday morning. Right. So you mentioned Michael Dewitt um, a couple times today, and, I, you know, made me think of um, – the fact that the police, from what I understand, never subjected him to a polygraph examination. He was only interviewed by phone. Why do you suppose he was never actually, I know that they, they, they had already listed it as a suicide, but why do you think that they never uh, asked him for at least a, a sit-down interview with the police or anything like that? Well, it's because they were set up. I, I've always believed, and I've always said that I, I, I say this in the film, too, I don't believe that the Seattle Police Department were directly involved in a conspiracy uh, to to cover up the death of the murder of Kurt Cobain. I just believe that they did a terrible job. They were set up by the, the missing persons report that Courtney called in right. claiming that she was Kurt, Kurt Cobain's mother, and the wording on that report was that he fled a rehab and had a shotgun and may be suicidal. So that's all the police had to go on when they found that body. And so when they walked in the door and, and they see this guy on the floor and the shotgun, yeah, that, they're right. You know, his mother was right. He got the shotgun and he was suicidal and he killed himself. Well, of course, we found out later that Courtney actually filed that report, and that had a lot to do with the wording in the report. Um, but, the you know, once they made that proclamation... I mean, I was up there to the house within hours. Dylan and I both went up there, and as you can see in the film, there's a reenactment of this. Uh, I asked to see the, the the homicide investigator in charge, which turned out to be Sergeant Cameron, and he told the police officer just to have me call the station at 3 o'clock later that day. And I said, I told him, I, I was in this house last night, you know, um, mm -hmm. and <laughs> I comment about this in the film. It's just unbelievable to me that a person is on the scene saying they were in the house last night, and now there's a, a dead body in the room above the garage at the house, and the homicide investigators just have this cavalier attitude, well, just call us later, 
you know. Right. I, I would never let somebody like that walk away. I would tell the police officer, keep him there until I get a chance to talk to him. And if he wants to leave, you know, hold him, handcuff him if you have to. Do not let that person leave. Right. Because anybody, if they, especially if they were truly investigating this as a possible homicide, anybody that claims they were in the house the night before would have to be a p- potential suspect. Right. You just don't let them walk away and say, just call me later, you know? Right. And it's yeah. just an example of the way this whole thing was handled, and this is why I've been fighting so hard to get it reopened and if they're going to refuse to do that, we certainly come up with enough evidence to prove that Kurt Cobain was murdered. The medical evidence alone proves that. So the findings need to be changed from suicide to undetermined at the very minimum. Right. And so, uh, you know, la- you know, another time, we, last time we spoke, uh, we also, you also told us, uh, you know, a very, uh, I felt touching story, uh, very tragic but touching story about two young individuals who decided to uh, commit suicide uh, because of the manner in which they thought that Kurt had died. And uh, you know, is that still such a strong motivating factor for you in terms of of solving this case? Well, yeah, of course it is. Um, over the years, uh, first of all, we heard about the copy cat suicides almost immediately. Mm. Uh, they started happening, and they were even being discussed on the radio when I was driving with Courtney uh, on the, you know, on the way to Carnation again. And and Courtney made some comment about, yeah, people think it's my fault and that that, that I should say something or whatever, you know. And uh, and it it was like it didn't really mean anything to her. Uh, and she just didn't like the fact that people were saying she should do something or or whatever. Um, so it, it distressed me, but I there was nothing I could do either at that time because I'm certainly not going to make up a story. Now I knew I I knew in my mind that they weren't killing themselves because Kurt Cobain had died like if he had died in a car accident or some other method, you know, had a heart attack or anything else. That wasn't why they were killing themselves. They were killing themselves because they thought he killed himself. And so since he was so cool and they looked up to him, and if they were depressed and they thought he was so depressed that he killed himself, then this must be a cool thing to do. I mean, these are young kids, 14 to 16 to 17, 18, you know, around that age, most of them. And their minds just aren't fully developed. They don't think properly. They don't realize, you know, they don't even think about the fact that once they pull that trigger, it's final. There's no going back. You know, that's the end of it all. And they just do it impulsively, thinking it's cool because Kurt Cobain did it. Um, my my belief on that is got confirmed really quick when I started speaking out and and posting on the Internet, uh, developing my website and talking about it, I started getting letters from these kids saying, I've been so depressed and I've I've been almost suicidal. I've thought about killing myself. And then somebody told me that Kurt Cobain might have been murdered, and I read your website, and it just totally changed my whole life. You know, and I, I mean, I've gotten hundreds and hundreds of letters like that. So that confirmed what I felt to begin with, that it, they weren't doing it because he was dead. They were doing it because they thought it was cool. And once they learned that even there was a possibility that it, he may not have committed suicide, that he may have been murdered, it, it changed their whole outlook. But again, I would never have gone there i would never have spoken out and said i believe kurt cobain was murdered just because people were killing themselves i'm not going to lie in order to save kids from doing what they're determined to do but i was anxious to to get to the bottom of this and but even then it still took me seven months um about a year or so after 
this was over, and I had been on several radio shows, and I'd been taught and speaking out about this, and I hadn't heard about any more uh, copycat suicides for quite a while. But about two years after Cobain died, I picked up the newspaper in Los Angeles, and right on, I believe it was on the front cover, it talked about a, a teenage couple. Uh, both of them were 16 years old, a boy and a girl, and they put a boombox-type radio on a rock and with a, um, I believe it was a cassette um, that they put in of Nirvana, uh, a Nirvana song playing really loud, and it describes how they held him. Oh, they wrote a letter talking about why they were killing themselves, and they mentioned Kurt Cobain and Nirvana in their letter and everything. But they were perfectly healthy, boyfriend and girlfriend. They took, they held hands, and they jumped off a 300-foot cliff to their deaths. Mm. And that almost brought me to my knees. I mean, that was just... Uh, in fact, this is probably one of the first times I've ever even talked about that without getting choked up. Because I'm not an actor. I'm not going to pretend that I'm getting really emotional. But um, practically every time I've, I've told that story, it just really gets to me. Because I've, I've had kids and grandkids, and I can't imagine what a parent must go through after having something like that happen. And it was such a waste of life, you know, such yeah. a waste of good life. Yeah, no. Thank you so much for your time today, Tom. That's uh, an excellent uh, way to leave the, the, this interview today. Um, uh, I really appreciate you coming on and uh, appreciate your insight into this case and all the work that you've done. Uh, you can check out Tom Grant's website, CobainCase.com, and uh, look for him with along with other forensic experts in the featured uh, upcoming docudrama by Benjamin Statler entitled Soaked in Bleach. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, Sean, and thank you for the great article you wrote on 21st Century. Thank you, and thank you for putting that up on your website. I really appreciate that. That was so nice of you. Well, it helped a lot of people, and a lot of people appreciate it, too. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Take okay. care. Okay, you too, Sean. Bye-bye. Bye. going on in the background? They're shaping up this particular deal. We're now going to be attempting to connect with Patrick now. Uh, momentarily, we'll see if we can connect with him again over the air. Uh, if not, yeah. we'll move. Forward. Patrick, are you there? Hello, yeah. Patrick. Okay. Yes. Thank. You. Oh, this is Jay. Okay. Sorry about that. Hi, hi, Jay. Okay. How are you, uh, Jay Dyer? Good. Jay's I can analysis. do my Patrick impersonation if you need. You want me to pretend to be Patrick? <laughs> well, I'm wondering when you're going to do mine because I'm sure you've heard me talk enough that you can probably probably do one of me. But. Um, Yes, uh, thank you so much for coming on the air. You are on the air live right now. Uh, and we've had a lot of, we've had a lot of technical difficulties connecting, uh, and I appreciate you guys on standby today. Um, uh, you know, as we've moved through the program here, um, you've done so much work, uh, over the years in terms of, uh, your analysis on film, pop culture, philosophy, religion, science, and esoteric study. And I've enjoyed so many of your articles here at 21 Wire, uh, as we've republished much of your work here. Um, but sure. what I wanted to bring you on today was to talk about um, some of Hollywood's most dark and brutal murders concerning uh, the rise of the 60s revolution music and uh, particular Laurel, Laurel Canyon. What can you tell us in terms of some of the, uh, the dark goings on with, with the music world and the covert uh, war, as it were, on musicians through the Laurel Canyon scene? Right. Well, I mean, certainly, you know, I'm no expert in that field per se. Dave McGowan's works a lot more in depth than, uh, you know, anything I would know about. But I have read, you know, quite a few books on the topic. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, I think when you consider this region, you have this sort of weird blend of, of, uh, you know, older Native American traditions, Native American Indians and sort of their, uh, their spirituality. And you've got a mix of that with sort of the influx of, you know, uh, the white man, and and so this whole region, you know, is sort of unique in that it's it's kind of a uh, an Indian burial ground, if you will, that's sort of maybe haunted, uh, you know, with the the ghosts of the past or something like that. So mm. I think um, you know out here in the mountains, you know, when you think back to you know all the strange uh, phenomena that people experience out here with uh, Area 51 and all that kind of stuff, 
Um, I think it's just uh, part of it is this the, the zeitgeist of, of, of this this place. You know what I mean? So um, when we when we look at some, something like Vegas, it's a good image of of the same uh, uh, the same thing as Hollywood, where you have a mix of everything from organized crime, mafia. You have intelligence agencies. You have, you know, uh, financial scams, banking. Uh, you know, Patrick was just giving me a really in-depth talk on all that. So, uh, when you mix all that with, uh, you know, the occult and things like that, you've just got a recipe for for all this kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, Laurel Canyon, as I understand it, sort of functions as the um, the initiator of a lot of the social change and the social engineering that we would see with pop culture. So even prior to, you know, the Haight-Ashbury uh, district and the rise of the hippies with Ken Kesey and uh, Tim Leary and all that, you've got uh, got sort of a, a musical uh, 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 culture creation, if you will, in, in the area of Laurel Canyon where you've got the rise of a lot of these bands that would become sort of the icons of counterculture. So you've got, you know, the Doors, and uh, when you consider Jim Morrison, his dad was involved in military intelligence. So there's a lot of interesting connections there, um, the mamas and the papas, things like that. So, you know, there's just there's just a million different rabbit holes to go down with this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I, you and I were talking the other day. Uh, when you look at even even cults like uh, you know the family, the family of God cult, you've mm-hmm. got you know the Phoenix family involved in all kinds of, of uh, you know tragedies. And, you know, there may be something uh, more to that. In 1991, uh, River Phoenix gave uh, an interview to Details Magazine where he talked about, you know, what that cult was up to. And now it's widely known. You know, Moses Berg was the head of this cult and he had all these, uh, you know, dubious connections. Mm-hmm. And uh, so this ends up being sort of a, pedo- a pedophile uh, front. And so, uh, you know, p- perhaps, you know, River Phoenix discussing this, you know, back in 1991 to Details Magazine might have been something more, you know, going on with his death. I mean, certainly, you know, uh, a drug overdose has happened, but we, we sort of see a pattern, you know, with uh, Heath Ledger, so forth and so on. And it goes, you know, maybe even deeper and darker with, uh, you know, Heath Ledger appearing in uh, uh, Dr. Parnassus, the Terry, Terry Gilliam film. Oh, sure, yeah, uh, I saw that film. You know, and, he, was... and he's... Go ahead, I'm sorry. And he's, you know, he's, he's in the hanged man position, right, in the film. Right, uh, and he's also, he's also got you know he's got the all seeing eye on his on his forehead. So, so maybe there was some sort of a you know uh, a, a, a pre liturgy going on there with you know perhaps what would go on uh, with with his demise. You know who knows? I don't I don't have any any proof of that, but it's just interesting to see the patterns that, that seem to emerge in these in these instances. Sure. Yeah. You know, recently we republished an article from you uh, about the Lost Boys film, and uh, I liked the article a lot. I thought it was interesting because, well, A, I, I enjoyed the film when I was younger, um, uh, but I liked your analysis of it, and I felt like um, it, it was a uh, very easy-to-understand analysis in terms of a breakdown of, of a cult structure and how they place that in pop culture film. Could you could you just give us a little bit uh, what your thoughts are on that in terms of that article and what, what made you write that article and what you're thinking about? Yeah, no, uh, definitely. I, you know, and like you, I grew up, uh, that's a classic, you know, it's a classic 80s maybe that, you know, we've all, we've all loved. Uh, but, you know, you've got, particularly with, uh, you know, uh, Corey Haim and Corey Feldman coming out and talking about sort of these uh, shadowy, uh, you know, pervert groups that, that were playing in the background and you know, uh, involved a lot of uh, a lot of child actors at that time. And so there was probably something to why we see so many tra- child actors, you know, growing up to be, uh, you know, kind of ruined lives. And, you know, I, I blame the parents, I guess, for most of that because, you know, a lot of the times the parents are farming their children out. If you've ever seen that, there's an excellent uh, documentary called Star Suckers that, exposes all that, but with the film Lost Boys, uh, you know, Joel Schum- Schumacher has quite a few, you know, esoteric uh, uh, indicators throughout his work. You know, we think of something like the, the number 23 with Jim Carrey, and that's mm-hmm. all about, uh, you know, numerology. And so I don't think that it's a stretch to to look back at Lost Boys and think, well, yeah, this is a goofy age, so maybe there's some darker, deeper stuff going on here. So you see, you see all kinds of stuff from, you know, the sun disc, uh, you know, the, the Egyptian sun disc, which is supposed to represent the the flight of the soul back to 
the ka force of the soul, uh, excuse me, the ba force of the soul flying back to the one. So that's mm-hmm. the sort of borrowed platonic imagery there. But, um, you know, throughout the narrative of the film, you have this, uh, this head of this coven who's, who's sort of recruiting, uh, quote, lost boys. So you have this, this Peter Pan imagery there. Mm-hmm. Um, Jam Perry, and uh, you know, it's rumored that he might have been a perv too. I don't know, but um, you know, there's, there's a clear, deeper significance here with this this shadowy guy who's the the, the head of this uh, you know this coven recruiting kids, and, and it also you know ultimately kind of has this sacrificial undertone to it because they're gonna you know they're gonna get rid of you know um, you know. Uh, uh, at, at a certain point, uh, Jamie Gers, the, 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 the female lead, says that, that, you know, that the goal was to sacrifice uh, Jason mm. Patrick, uh, his, mm-hmm. his character. Uh, so she, she ends up falling in love with him. But, but again, we see this, this image of human sacrifice is definitely there in the narrative, which is odd, you know, for, for, a, for a kid's film. That's right. Film. It almost reminds me, I mean, you know, it just reminds me of so many 80s films that came out Actually, I mean, yeah. it's it's a little different, but uh, and of course, Dark Crystal. I'm sure you've uh, even done an analysis, I think, on that, right? Uh, that film, or maybe you've talked about it before. Um, but there was, you Which know, film? Film, uh, Dark the Dark Crystal, the Jim. Oh, Hattie. absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got uh, you get these two sort of dialectical, uh, dualistic uh, elders versus the Skeksis, and um, you know, you have this this certain conjunction between stellar phenomena that come together and. And uh, it's all based around the crystal, and you know the crystal's cracked, so the world has sort of fallen from this, uh, this uh, platonic idea of how the fall came from the one. So we're all existing in a state of multiplicity because the one fractured. Um, and so the, the crystals, you know, in this, in this narrative, are sort of fragments of that original unity. And so you have these two um, parallel good and evil forces. And at the end of the film. Uh, the the Skeksis and the sort of old uh, Buddhist type elder, uh, you know, lamas or something. The, 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 they they meld together into one, right? So that the the overall narrative is that there's not really good or evil. So they're, mm-hmm. they're you know they're both sides of the same coin because mm-hmm. at the end you have the convergence of both good and evil. Yeah, I, I might add. I might add also on top of that, what the Skeksis are doing is they're they're stealing the children from the Gelflings, and they're basically mind controlling them and sapping their magical force. Right, so uh, we can de- we can definitely see a parallel with uh, with uh, you know what what probably goes on with a lot of this uh, esoteric occult stuff. Right. So, what is your knowledge of on that esoteric and occult topic? Um, what is your what is your knowledge of the Sharon Tate murders, and what is your take on on that in terms of the research you've done and uh, 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 any of that stuff? If you have any comments on the Ma- Manson murder, well, uh, I, I've looked at I've looked at uh, Bugliosi's book, and I've looked at um, uh, uh, Peter Lavenda's whole trilogy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sinister Forces is, is essentially structured around the Manson uh, the Manson situation, and he makes the argument that. That this is really, um, it was really done for uh, multiple purposes. You have a ritual effect, um, and then you also have a, a, a mass psyop effect. You know, so everyone who uh, you know lived at that time, you talk to people from that generation. You know, it's, it's sort of burned burned into the subconscious of everybody from that generation. Um, and so, what appears to be the case is, you know, maybe there's some evidence that maybe there was. Uh, you know, a, a, a darker, sort of deeper cult behind what was going on because we, we learned that Manson actually went uh, through all the levels of Scientology while he was in, in prison. Mm. So he became a, a, theta, a theta clear at one point. So we have this direct connect to, you know, sort of shady uh, cultic groups like Scientology. And then so then Manson comes out kind of this new persona uh, and then goes on to you know, try to strike up a, a musical career uh, and, and adopts the idea of Halter Skelter from the Process Church. So, you know, there's definitely involved, he, he's definitely involved in these subculture uh, occultic groups, and you have that same Gnostic duality view in the Process Church while Manson uh, adopts this. And if you look into these groups, 
you know, you see a lot of intelligence connections, a lot of darker, you know, uh, um, a lot of uh, definitely dark side of the occult type stuff mm-hmm. that is, is there in the background. So there's there's some good evidence to suggest. Uh, if you look at that Maury Terry's book, The Ultimate Evil, that you know that maybe there was something actually guiding Manson behind this. Yeah, what do you think about the theory that there was another Manson, someone called Manson too? Uh, uh, because I believe Maury Terry discusses that at some point in his book. Yes. Uh, yeah, you have- you're, yeah, you're right. I, I, I don't know for sure, but, but there's definitely some evidence suggesting that, just like there's a, a mirrored um, situation with, with the Zodiac stuff where you have... Right, um, good time. The possibility, right, the, the possibility of not just one killer but uh, multiple killers that are actually sort of copycatting or doing the same type of, of killing. So there's definitely something to that, probably. Right. And, you know, I, I know when we, we spoke in person briefly, uh, you know, uh, a few days ago, um, I brought up the movie, um, I believe it's the, uh, uh, the Town That Dreaded Sundown, and I believe it, it's a remake. It could be a remake. I'm not sure. Uh, I think it is. Um, but that, that deals with duality and actually uh, multiple criminals as well in terms of, they thought it was just one person committing these horrific crimes, but it was actually, in fact, oh, yeah. it was arranged by a, a, a group of people, which, uh, you know, would, would speak to a lot of the stuff that actually occurs in real life, it seems like. It would seem so, definitely. Yeah. 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 Um, so. And I, I think to, I think if you're going to pull off these kinds of things, you know, you probably do need, you know, more than just one person running around doing it. I mean, even Manson himself, you know, is using, uh, you know, he's not technically, by the, the DSMV uh, definitions, he's not technically a psychopath because he didn't actually uh, commit the murders. Because he didn't, he didn't actually commit them, so he's more of a sociopath who, who's sort of running this this uh, you know weird little cult cult right. really killing thing. So perhaps you know he had a handler, he had somebody above him. There was a book I read years ago, and it's it's not really super fresh in my mind, but one that I think you might enjoy. Um, called The Dead Circus, and I forget the name of the author, but uh, it basically outlined uh, the start of Manson sort of uh, getting involved in the music scene and kind of working his way through the music scene, and uh, it also outlined the the death of Bobby Fuller, who was, uh, I guess, dating Nancy Sinatra at the time, and he left her walking after an argument one night, and then he ended up dead a couple days later, uh, asphyxiated in his car, I believe, or there was some sort of this issue with his car was lit on fire or something to that effect. Uh, but he, he died basically in his vehicle um, uh, after leaving Nancy Sinatra, and many suspected that Frank had something to do with that as well as others. But this is a really interesting th- a book that also discusses um, what we're talking about here uh, in terms of how Manson seemed to sort of, he was sort of in the folk singing uh, uh, background, right? And am I right understanding that, that he was a, sort of in the folk singing world and he sort of worked his way into this other Realm of, yeah, as I understand it, yeah, and, and then he, you know, befriended Brian Wilson and, uh, you know, the Beach Boys and kind of got right. into that crew um, and was kind of hanging around with Dennis Hopper and some of those guys and at that time. And, do you uh, remember, yeah, do you do you recall at, at any point, and you don't have to have an answer to this because I'm kind of putting you in the spot, so don't feel pressed. If you can't, we'll just yeah. move on. But uh, uh, do you happen to know if uh, Manson was, um, when, when, at what point, did people start to realize that he might be involved in something else or that he was involved in the, the, the cult-like a- aspects and things like that? Um, was there a point where it, it was a slow transition into his cult or was it actually pretty abrupt uh, at the point where he decided to do that? Do you remember? I, I had a, a little trouble hearing some of that, but uh, I, I think you said, you're you asking, was there a specific point where it was you could pinpoint where he was involved in the occult? Is that what you said? Yeah, if there was something that struck you in your reading, and the, the, either the Maury Terry book or some of these other uh, books that you've read about. Yeah, well, there's a there's an interesting um, thesis that maybe even prior to this, because he he was sort of a, a grew up with a single mom. He was just kind of a drifter drifter kind of guy, uh, and you know had been involved in some petty crime, but he didn't seem to be uh, that intelligent of a guy. He just kind of seemed like a you know sort of a your average thug dude. And then uh, at a certain point, he was living in Kentucky. And uh, having spent a lot of time in Kentucky, there, there, are, there are burial mounds everywhere. Uh, so uh, Lavenda, in, his, uh, in the book specifically on Manson in the trilogy, uh, he puts forth some evidence that Manson was actually going out to the burial mounds and sort of you know, engaging in his, 
maybe his own little, uh, you know, exp- experimentations with the occult. So mm-hmm. there's possibility that maybe even, you know, at a, at a young age in Kentucky, 18, 19, 20, you know, he was, he was experimenting then. And then if we look at somebody like David Berkowitz, we see a similar pattern where both Manson and Berkowitz for a time got involved with some military, uh, uh, civil air force. I don't remember what it was, but some, you know, short stint military stuff, National Guard or something. And then they, they immediately went into sort of a, a far hard right fundamentalist evangelicalism. So you had this with both Manson and, uh, um, Berkowitz for a while, uh, and then they sort of went off, you know, off the rails later on. So there, there's a lot of times with a lot of these people, there's a, a bizarre, you know, hard, weird fundamentalism when they're growing up that, that I think sort of lays the groundwork for their apocalypticism, you know, especially with Manson and Helter Skelter, and there's going to be this, you know, coming cataclysmic uh, uh, race war. You see what right. I'm saying? Yeah, no, it's very, yeah, no, I, I like that description, actually. It makes a lot of sense in terms of, you know, having having grown up being forced to sort of uh, view something a certain way uh, and having such a strong uh, presence of that in your life and how that would maybe uh, possibly even create some sort of, uh, you know, episodic, uh, you know, some, some, some sort of episode within the person to, to uh, react or act out uh, because of that. So... Especially, um, especially when it's when it's dealing with sort of really repressive, strict sexuality, right? Uh, and and then you combine that with apocalypticism. So we see that in so many of these these figures that later turn to you know sort of the dark end of of, of the spiritual spectrum. Um, you know, we saw this even with Crowley. You know, Crowley was part of the Plymouth Brethren, which was you know this is what he was raised with this millennialist uh, you know cultic view of dispensational end times and you know, the end is just about to come and you know uh, Jesus is going to destroy everything and so you better not uh, you know you better not have any dirty thoughts you might you know if you get a boner you're going to hell immediately <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, yeah no I, I, I it's one of those things where I know that we recently we published on the title is escaping me off the top of my head here um, and I don't want to go live on the air on the website because it'll it'll trigger some sort of ad but um, we have an article we published from Soul of the East uh, by um, by Daniel Spaulding. Uh, I know who you are also in uh, you know friends with and connected to. Uh, right. Uh, and um, it was an interesting article because you know he talks about the polarization of uh, the politici- politicization of uh, of, exactly. of religion and politics and just sort of you know uh, that polarization between the two. And I found it really interesting article in, in terms of his connections making what you were just talking about with. Crowley and, and sort of that, that it sort of just triggered something in the connection of, of that article where he, he actually talks about um, uh, you know some of the connecting factors in geopolitical uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you, go you, ahead, don't, yeah you don't see that tied, tied into geopolitics often so that, that I think was the excellent part of his article so right. I, think, I think what he's getting at where he's, where he's spot on especially is the idea that apocalypticism and end times uh, ideology becomes a, sort of a, a social engineering technology where you can where you can move a group in a certain way. So Patrick and I were just talking last night about how you, you see a, a mirrored uh, a mirrored aspect of this with you know Islamic fundamentalism, right? So um, you know you've got, you've got you know, ISIS or Wahhabism and these these different groups that have. Um, their own eschatologies, which is the study of the end times, uh, and then you have the dispensationalists, and so these these different ideologies are, are manipulated to you know mold different groups and move them in different ways. So if you have this you know just defeatist idea that you know the world's about to end in the next two or three years or whatever, you think back to the the goofy predictions of Hal Lindsey in his book uh, Late Great Planet Earth. You know he's saying, <laughs> saying the rapture is coming in 1988 with all these elaborate you know calculations from whatever dates, which is all obviously a bunch of baloney. It never, never happened. Or if, if the rapture happened, it wasn't any, anyone we knew. <laughs> right, right. So, wow. you know, from there, what be, what becomes clear, like Daniel pointed out, uh, is that this is all, you know, basically geopolitical manipulation, especially with the, the uh, evangelical crowd, you know, with, with the, uh, you know, sort of a, a that the, 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 secular state of Israel is sort of somehow the, the only manifestation of, 
uh, you know, divine representation on earth or something like that. Right. You know, and that's an interesting topic uh, to really broach because you got to dance around that a little bit. And I think he did a really great job of, of presenting that information, but without being uh, overly yeah. heavy handed, which I without thought Without being was too, right. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, so, yeah, so um, what, what, uh, what other films have been on your mind or something that you've watched recently or even a book that you've read that, uh, that sort of, uh, that's maybe some upcoming uh, work from uh, Jay's analysis? Uh, well, definitely where we, where I want to go next is to get deeper into Lynch. So, uh, you know, Inland Empire comes up next because I think that's the, the, the culmination of his, uh, loosely called, or loosely titled Hollywood trilogy. So, so from Lost Highway to Mulholland Drive, you conclude with, uh, uh, Inland Empire, which was more on the indie spectrum of things because it's, it's, you know, it's like three hours and it's, you know, it's all shot. Handheld, and so it's 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 very very different from the other two, and it's even more uh, more of a nightmare if you can imagine that. Sort of, it's Mulholland Drive's own nightmare, <laughs> right? <laughs> how I describe it. So we're going to go in Inland Empire and look at the possibility of mind control, and you know Hollywood being sort of a, uh, a predatory uh, system that sort of sucks in you know Midwest girls and turns them sure. into you know uh, druggies and whores. So. That's that's a lot of what's going on in Inland Empire, and uh, and then from there, uh, geopolitically, uh, I'm looking at uh, Fitzgerald and Gould's book, uh, Invisible Empire: The Untold Story of Afghanistan. So, mm-hmm. so uh, definitely look for that. I'll be uh, doing some uh, some articles and po- uh, podcasts on that, where we have the background to the British Empire's view of what's called mystical imperialism, where the idea is that uh, you know. The, Britain is sort of the successor of the, the previous empires, and it's destined to, you know, to take over the world and to rule very much in the same way that American ideology has the idea of manifest destiny, you know, that the Western expansion was a, a sort of a divinely appointed uh, move uh, and um, move west. And so in the same way, what we have with the British Empire is, is that, that same ideology. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, we'll look forward to, to those uh, to those different uh, the podcasts right. and analysis. Uh, 